This next one I identified with uh, because I grew up on a little cattle farm in Missouri. We raised um, um, purebred Angus cattle. We also had a little feeder operation to keep a kind of an even cash flow. And so I, I identified with this guy. He was a cattle farmer from a little town outside of Kathmandu, Nepal, in the Himalayan Mountains. And according to his obituary, he never saw a doctor, never set foot in a hospital. He smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 120 years. Uh, he wasn't a vegetarian, kind of raising cattle. He ate red meat every day. And um, in April of 1998, he died at age 141. When he was a young man, he led the first land survey team around Kathmandu in 1888. The last one I want to share with you tells a lot of stories. It's one of my favorite obituaries. It's about an Iranian woman by the name of Mazumi Dusty. And um, this was published in the Rocky Mountain News Wire Service out of Denver, Colorado in January of 1995. It said, Mizumi Dusty died at age 161. Now, this seems pretty outrageous, but you have to give a lot of credibility to this obituary because she was survived by six living children ranging in age from 120 to 128. They hadn't even left home to go to college yet. <laughs> I thought this was a very profound observation by her oldest son, Golam. Her oldest son said his mother had never visited a doctor, never taken any prescription medications or over-the-counter medications. She only used herbs during her life. Now, do you think she had access to vaccinations when she was a child? Did she, any of her kids get vaccinated? No, they were born up in a little rock hut up in the mountains of um, a village, uh, Kalatin Bala, in Khorasan province in Iran. Okay, and I guarantee you she was functional till very close to her death because they don't have nursing homes, and they're not just going to find some way to give her IVs to keep her alive. They're in that rock hut. And so she had to be still able to snap beans and skin carrots and cook and sing lullabies to great, 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 great grandkids. And whatever she did, she did sewed maybe. We all have these genetic capacity to live well beyond 100. Experts in longevity, experts in gerontology and genetics tell us we all, every one of us, each and every one of us in this room has the ability to live well beyond 100. And the only reason why we don't, the shortest way to say it, is because we do too much of the bad stuff and not enough of the good stuff. That's a, most succinct way I can say it. We all have the genetic capability to do it. One of the fascinating things to me is that we ask doctors about what to do for health and longevity. Now, if doctors knew what they were talking about, that would make sense. But I'm a scorecard kind of guy, and so I'm looking at doctors and saying, really, do they really, really know what they're talking about? On my tape, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, which came out in 1994, I had a statistic in there from a small survey. It said uh, doctors live to be 57.6, and I rounded up to 58 to give them the better, better for the doubt, and doctors just went ballistic. Well, Wallach, you've got to be lying. We, we don't live to be 58. We live to be 75 like everybody else. Well, even if they live to be 75 like everybody else, that wouldn't be too good a recommendation because if they're the holders of all knowledge and health and they follow their own recommendations, they should live to be 85 or 95 or 100 or something. Well, they didn't want to believe me, so they did their own study, and they came out five years later in 1999 with the answer to their study, and they found out that Doctors of America lived to be 56. So I missed it by two years. <laughs> so why do we ask people how to live a long, healthful life who only live to be 56 on the average? That's because they have convinced us that health care is very, very, not only important, but also very um, detailed. It's very complicated, and you have to go to school for 14 years to know how to deal with health care. And they've convinced Americans that this is true. I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper or watch TV or listen to the radio without health care and Medicare and Medicaid and all the stuff being on the front, right? Well, let's look at some more scorecards and see if we're getting the bang for a buck. Right now, the entire world each year spends $2.7 trillion for health care, $2.7 trillion with a T. Out of that $2.7 trillion each year that the world spends for health care, the U.S. alone, alone the U.S. spends $1.6 trillion, more than half. And yet, in April of 1990, we ranked 17th in longevity. There were 16 other countries whose peoples live longer than we did. We didn't even rank in the top 10. You have to ask, well, who is number one? What did they do different from us? Well, the Japanese were number one. They lived to be 79.1, uh, 4.1 years longer than we did. And the interesting thing was... The Japanese are heavy smokers. 68% of the Japanese smoke three to five packs of cigarettes a day. They are heavy smokers. They are the smokingest nation on earth. And yet they have 85% less cancer and cardiovascular disease than we do. 
Japanese consume 12 to 15 grams of salt every day, an entire salt shaker per person. We're supposed to consume approximately one gram, 1,000 milligrams a day of salt, and yet they have 85% less cardiovascular disease than we do. We dropped two atomic bombs on the Japanese to end World War II. They've had more radiation per person than any other culture on Earth. Nobody cleaned it up. They've been wallowing in all the radiation in the soil and water and environment ever since we dropped the bombs on them. Nobody cleaned it up. And they have 85% less cancer than we do. And so I want to know what they know. In all this adversity, they're still living longer than us and are healthier than us. You say, well, maybe that was a bad study. It should be redone. Well, they did 10 years later, June of 2000. They reran the same study, and the Japanese maintained number one. But they dropped from 79.1 down to 74.5. So this was our chance to catch up and surpass them with all this money we're spending. But instead, we dropped from 17th longevity all the way down to 24th because we went from 75 to 70. There's now 23 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure out we're not getting the bang for the buck. You don't have to be a genius to say, well, maybe the medications we're getting aren't doing any good. Maybe the advice we're getting is not the best. No matter what the doctors tell us, we're going the wrong direction. So you can't deny these facts, OK? You can't deny the facts. Well, there's 250,000 drugs, pharmaceuticals, in the PDR, the physician's desk reference, that they have access to to treat people in America. There's new ones coming out all the time. They're always bragging about how many billions of dollars worth of research they spend every year to find new drugs. And if you take out the 500 antibiotics, it still leaves 249,500 drugs. There's not a single one of those designed to cure anything. There's not a single drug in the PDR except maybe antibiotics might cure a strep throat. Other than that, there's not a single drug in the PDR that cures anything. They're all designed to milk your insurance policies. They're all designed to milk Medicare and Medicaid. They're all designed to milk your, your wallet because there's no laws requiring the pharmaceutical companies to manufacture drugs that cure, even though they could. But because there's no laws requiring them to do it, they don't. This just came out in January of this year. Health spending has biggest surge in 11 years. We're going to jump right over here and say, U.E. Reinhardt, a health economist at Princeton, said, the increase in health care spending is no surprise. This is what the American people ask for when they abolished managed care. And what he said there was this. For about eight years, the cost of health care stayed the same when there was managed care. Doctors didn't like it because managed care kept them from doing unnecessary tests. Managed health care kept them from doing unnecessary surgeries, writing prescriptions for unnecessary drugs. And they didn't like it because it cut their income in half. They weren't getting the kickbacks anymore. And so they began to whisper to their patients, you know, there's an economist, there, there's a bookkeeper making decisions what tests you should have and what drugs you should get and what treatment you should have. It should be my job. I'm the doctor. It should be my job. And after a while, people said, yeah, it should be the doctor's job. Why, why is some bookkeeper doing that? And so they convinced the American public that, that managed care was no good. And so people then complained to their legislators who then voted it out. And of course, their workplaces went to other things other than managed care. And immediately, when managed care got dumped, health care doubled and tripled. And it's just going up like a skyrocket because now there's no controls on the doctors. Well, how does this affect us? This came out in May of 2003. Age 65 plus workforce rose sharply since 1980. Americans are living longer and they're fretting about their financial security. What is the biggest reason why people are worried about their financial security? Health care. Health care, right? Health care is the biggest thing that people worry about. As you get older, you need more health care. And um, there's all kinds of things happening because of health care. Doctors always get paid. You're going to pay it. Your employer's going to pay it. The government's going to pay it. They don't worry. They're happy, right? I thought this was a really a very interesting editorial. This came out in February of this year, just last month, just about a month ago, Outsourcing the American Dream. How many of you heard of outsourcing? Okay, good. That's half of you. Outsourcing means that they're sending American jobs to other countries. I'll give you an example. Um, these big corporations are training... Indian people in New Delhi how to speak with a Texas accent. So when you call up, you know, you see something on TV you want to order or in a catalog it says call this toll-free number or you may want to make an appointment for an appliance repairman to come out of your house and put a new motor in your, in your dryer or something. When you call up they say, howdy ma'am, how y'all doing? Because they've taught these guys in Pakistan and India how to speak with a Texas accent. 
how can we hip you? It only rings three times, and they pick it up in New Delhi, India, and they take this order. Well, what they said was this. By the time 2006 comes, between 35 and 45% of current full-time IT jobs, which are these information technology jobs, will be sent overseas. This amounts to 14 million jobs. 14 million jobs in the next year and a half are going overseas, and here's why. While telephone operators in the United States earn an average of $12.50 an hour plus their health care benefits, in India, they earn less than a dollar and no health care benefits. And because of NAFTA, how many heard of NAFTA? The NAFTA agreement with all these countries gave our government permission to give corporations tax benefits to send the jobs out of the country. We give tax benefits to, to companies to send jobs out of the country. Now, how absurd is that? That is really absurd. It's absolutely criminal, right? Now, it says um, payroll clerks in Asian nation take home less than $2 an hour and no health benefits, and their counterparts in this country averages $15.17 an hour with health benefits. So as health benefits climb and companies don't want to pay them anymore, they start outsourcing the jobs to countries that don't have health benefits. And what happens to the people who are here left in the United States? Well, they still have to pay for their health care. This came out in June of 2003. Study finds doctors skip key steps of treatments. Doctors fail to take about half the recommended steps for treating common illnesses, such as high blood pressure and diabetes, suggesting that health care in the United States isn't nearly as good as many people thought. Well, that's not a new <laughs> belief, right? This came out in October of 1999. Doctors say they'd lie to get insurers to pay. This is a study done in eight cities, 169 internists, and they presented this to the annual meeting, the American, Association, American Medical Association conference, annual conference in Los Angeles in October of 1999. And I'm just going to go over two of them. This is actually quite a thick report. I'll go over two of them. It said 58% supported lying so a severely ill 55-year-old could get a coronary bypass, even though her pains were not becoming more frequent as the insurer required during the managed care days. Now, if your pains are not becoming more frequent and the, the degree of pain remains the same, this is called stable angina. And how many of you heard of nitroglycerin? Yeah, for 30, 50 cents uh, treatment, you can put a nitro tab under your tablet. It may cost you six to 10 bucks a month to deal with the pain. And as long as the frequency is the same, the pain level is the same, you can do that forever. And also, um, how many of you heard of Dean Ornish? Well, Dean Ornish was an MD, PhD from Harvard Medical School. He did a great double blind study where he took hundreds of people with 85%, 90% blockage of their three main coronary arteries. And he put them on a restricted diet, gave them some supplements, gave them low-impact exercise like yoga and swimming. And in six months' time, all their arteries were open 100% without surgery. This was impossible, according to surgeons. The only way to deal with blocked arteries in the heart is to do a bypass, right? They, there's no way you can do that with diet and exercise and supplements. And so they made him do it again. Another double-blind study worked <laughs> results exactly the same. Well, what a doctor should say today when somebody comes to them with angina Stable angina, say, look, let's get on a Dean Ornish program. It's actually going to cut your food bill in half, save a little money here. We're going to get you on a little nutritional program, a uh, supplement program, do some yoga. You can do that for free at home. Well, here's a $10 tape. You can learn how to do these yoga exercises. You come back in in six months, and if you're improved, we'll just keep doing the same thing. If it gets worse, then we, we'll consider the surgery. But there's no doctors who do that. Doctors kind of lie a little bit, but they want you, well, worse than that, they want God to believe that they're lying on behalf of Mabel or Ruth or Roy says, Lord, you know I'm lying, but it's not because of me. I'm lying because them mean old managed uh, care insurance companies won't, won't let Roy have a triple bypass. And Roy needs a triple bypass, so forgive me, Lord, because I have to lie for Roy. Now, why is that doctor lying? Is he ri lying for Roy's behalf? No, he's lying for his own behalf. He wants $85,000. Keep that cash flow going. 